<clears throat> Hello, good morning, all of you. I uh, hope you're doing well. And congratulations for those, those who got a uh, lab one result uh, yesterday. <clears throat> I, know you, I know like uh, many of you will be having questions regarding this uh, lockdown. Many were asking me yesterday, like when the academy will be open. Uh, the thing is the uh, online courses are uh, going on as per schedule, but uh, we are just waiting for the government guidelines. As, as soon as they open the this lockdown, we will be able to open the academy as well, right? <clears throat> So I hope you are able to see me, you're able to see my slide. If yes, if you can just raise your hand, there is an option of raising hand there. Right. If uh, there is one guy, Dr. Anayo saying I can't hear. So you can do one thing, you can just log out and log in again. That would be helpful because everyone, they're raising hand, meaning they are able to uh, see and they are able to hear properly. <clears throat> so we'll be just starting in a couple of minutes. Uh, we're just waiting for more people to join. Uh, it's 10 o'clock, so just maybe maximum two more minutes I'll take and then we will start. <clears throat> Any questions, if you have got, you can just uh, throw all the questions and uh, uh, during the end of the session, we will discuss those questions, right? So don't you worry. I hope some of you are enjoying uh, this uh, lockdown as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, it has become a bit frustrating now. It's been like a, a month, even like uh, just staying home, doing nothing, not going out. So it becomes difficult. Lots of question, time for PLAP2 and all. Okay, it's fine, it's fine. Just keep on throwing all the questions. <clears throat> End of the session, you will see like most of the questions will be answered. And if not, uh, uh, I will answer them. No worries at all. <clears throat> People are still joining. Uh, we are having at least, uh, at the moment, 355 candidates. It's increasing 360. Actually, uh, for the webinar, uh, 1850, like 1850 candidates have registered. And we are hoping around 1000 candidates will be attending and it's increasing, it's 375 people. <clears throat> All right, so let's start uh, slowly, slowly, and uh, yeah, rest of uh, the candidates will join. No worries at all. Just a sec. <clears throat> All right, so welcome to Aspire Education. We always say take every chance and drop every fear, right? <clears throat> these are our all social media details. And if you want to join us, you can join us on uh, these platforms. We'll see these things again. <clears throat> all right, so let's start the uh, PLAP2 introduction. So what is PLAP2? It's very like a uh, common question. Plap, you know, you have given lots of exam in your life. Uh, 
uh, usually the exams that we are giving in our university or like for example plab one these are oski they're not oski exam they're like uh, multiple choice questions you have given but this is exam this is oski this is objective structured and clinical exam so what you will be having there you'll be having patients there you'll be having patients inside uh, the room and you'll be talking to them you'll be doing the history you'll be doing the counseling ethics examination it depends what kind of stations uh, what kind of scenario you are getting <clears throat> what's happening in the exam uh, they have got scenario from everything they have got scenario from medicine from surgery from gynae from pediatrics from psychiatry counseling examination everything and they can give us every anything i mean so what happens roughly this exam is mostly on counseling and ethics basis uh, in september 2016 they have changed the pattern of plaf2 why they change the pattern of plaf2 because what they know they know international medical graduates i mean us we are good in medical knowledge where we are lacking we are lacking in communication skills we are maybe not that good in communication skills so what they have done they have changed the pattern and in changing the pattern what they have done now we have got 18 scenario and out of 18 you will see you will see what's happening half of the exam i will say like eight to nine station i mean half of the exam is counseling and ethics only so half of the exam is counseling and ethics right so if you are good in counseling ethics you will see you will be able to uh, do half of the exam right plus what else we have got we have got um, examination mannequins so roughly examination mannequin three to four station from examination mannequins they give us rest is history taking so usually if you see medicine history uh, roughly two to three station and rest one station from surgery one gynae one peds and one psych so this is a rough idea i mean it's not like this is the thing they are following in all the exams no it is a rough idea it's a rough idea in in, in one of the exam you may get uh, one or two examinations only and in one exam you may get five six as well but roughly what we have seen what we have seen is uh, they are giving us three to four examination eight to nine ethics counseling station so exam is mostly on talking talking and talking you have to talk a lot actually in this exam right so as we know we have got 18 18 scenario you will be getting 18 different patients and you will be having eight minutes each with each patient you might be thinking why this exam is time bound because when you have got a patient you should have ample of time so that you can ask everything you can do proper examination and all but yeah in the uk actually you will see all the exams they are time bound why because when you start working as a gp for example in the house in the gp clinic also your consultation is time bound for example like uh, you have given a particular time to the patient for the for the consultation and if you are not done with the first patient then the second third patient everyone will be delayed so what they have got they have got this uh, fixed time criteria so nobody will suffer so that's why in the exam also they are preparing us from today itself so what's happening so it is eight minute station every station is of eight minutes and total we are going to have 18 stations right reading the task outside one minute 30 second so what happens um, you will be standing outside the cubicle first and you will be having one minute 30 second to read the task i'll show you what kind of task they give so they will be giving you a task and you need to read that task you have to think what i'm supposed to do what's the problem of my patient once you are done with all these things and then there will be a bell the bell will say begin and you go in and you will be having eight minute inside with your patient so what is happening what's happening for one station it is taking eight minutes and one and a half minutes so it is taking nine and a half minute for each station as simple as that right so we have got 18 station but we have got two rest station as well because do you think it's easy for us just to talk 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 nine and a half nine and a half continuously and total duration of the exam is three hours ten minutes it might not be that easy for you just to talk for that long hours so what they have got they are giving us two rest stations as well meaning uh, uh, that nine and a half minute you can just do rest you can have a cup of coffee if you want you can have some cookies you can use washroom uh, you can have a glass of water so all these facilities will be available and you can avail those things so this is what happens in the rest station and rest station can be any station actually what i mean is uh, uh for example like it's not like uh station third or fourth or station 16 17 only 
will be the rest station. Actually, you can have any station as rest station. So what happens when you go to the GMC building, they will give you a number from 1 to 20. They are going to give you a number from 1 to 20, and they will tell you like number 7 or number 17, they are rest station. So the, just the, the hypothetical I told you, like number 7 or 17, they are rest station. So you, I mean, some of you, I mean, two of you will be having eat like seven or 17 as well so maybe one or two of you will be starting from the rest station itself that is also the possibility right so that is how it works plus uh, you will see uh, total duration is three hours 10 minutes to rest stations so in total we'll be having 20 station 18 real plus two rest stations that is how it works right and one more thing you know the the patient do you think you have got real patients? Actually, no, they are not real patients. They are professional simulators, they are professional actors. So they know what they're doing and they are perfect in their thing. Uh, you know, I have met a few of these actors actually in one of the conference, I met two of these actors and they introduced themselves that I'm a professional actor. I work for Manchester Medical College and I work for GMC. So they're professional, they're doing the thing and they're professionally doing the thing. But you know, uh, you won't feel like they are doing acting. You feel like they have got this problem. The way they 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 do the things, the way they do the acting, everything is like is like perfect, right? So this is what happens uh, in the exam. What happened nowadays? They are taking around 72 candidates for uh, a morning session and 72 candidates. Uh, sorry, in total, one day they are taking 72 candidates. Uh, 36 in the morning time, 36 in the afternoon. So what they have got, they have got two wings, you can say green or blue wing. So they will call 36 candidates, for example, in the morning at 8 o'clock. I, I, I mean, once you book the exam, they'll tell you the time that you have to be there. So 36. So they will do the, some briefing like how and what are the things to be expected during the exam. And they will uh, do the briefing and all. And after that, they are going to divide into, into two groups, two groups, 18 and 18. Right. But the scenario, the stations will be the same. Right. And uh, so these 36 will appear in the morning and 36 candidates will appear in the afternoon. This is how it works. And the station will remain the same for all 72 candidates. And the result is also based on these uh, performance of these 72 candidates. Right. So this is uh, just a rough uh, uh, plot too. Uh, in, in the exam, uh, do you think you're allowed to carry any watch or uh, there will be any clock? Nothing. Actually, no, nothing is there. Uh, you don't have anything to know that you have got eight minutes or you have got uh, two minutes left or something like that so it's a very tricky situation so what happens uh, after you have read the task for one and a half minute you will go inside inside you know you have got eight minutes but uh, for example the station says you have to take history and do the management i are taking history don't know how much time it is because you have to jump to the management as well because management is pretty important because that will be having its own mark so inside the cubicle you just have one hint you know you have got eight minutes they have divided the, those eight minutes into two parts six minute and two minutes six minute and two minute so what happens usually what happens uh, after six minute there will be a bell after six minute there will be a bell saying two minutes left so that's the only thing, that's the only hint that you have got, I would say. That's the only hint you have got, which will tell you two minutes left. So if you feel that you have to move on to other thing, other than your history taking or other than your examination, you feel like uh, I need to cover this particular part as well. So you can move to that particular part, right? So that is how it uh, works. <clears throat> let's see the marking uh, system actually so marking system is this uh, they all the station they are of 12 mark so we have got total 18 station each station is of 12 marks i'll tell you how these 12 marks they are uh, spreading they are uh, spreading these 12 marks in three domains four 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 for data gathering four for management four for interpersonal skills I'll explain these. Uh, the thing is they have got iPad and what they do, they give us the grade in each domain. A is four, B is three, C is two, D is one, E is zero. But the thing is you won't be able to know how and how much they have given it to you because these things will not be uh, displayed to us. Uh, let's see what we should know. We should know this thing, passing criteria. What are the things we should be doing so that we can pass this exam? 
right we have to fulfill two criteria we have to get above the average score see average score can be anything the total score of the exam if we see it is 18 station plus 12 mark each right so it is 216 this is the total score of the exam right what is the average score average score a score will be different it is different for different different days for example you are appearing on uh, uh, say 2nd of june so the passing may be something different and somebody is appearing on 3rd of june the passing will be different so the passing will be different different for different different days that is how it works uh, the roughly the passing score i would say it's around 125 to 130 nowadays uh, like initial like if you go two years back the passing score used to be around 110 115 but it has increased nowadays competition is increasing to be honest so the passing score nowadays uh, it's around uh, like uh, 125 to 30 so if you are getting more than 130 it's a <clears throat> it's a pass it's a short short pass because we haven't seen uh, like uh, the passing score going beyond that particular thing but one more thing you have to have two criteria that's your first criteria you have another criteria as well <clears throat> you have to pass 11 station out of 18 you have to pass 11 station <clears throat> So we have to fulfill these two criteria. Uh, you know, sometimes what happens, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you don't know much about one scenario, try to get as much as you can. Because if you get zero in one, if you got zero in one of the station, then later on it is difficult to compensate that zero because you know you have to get above the average score and you have to pass 11 stations as well. So be very, very, very careful regarding all these things. Right. So get get above the average score and pass 11 out of 18. So these two criteria you have to fulfill to pass this exam. Right. You know, many candidates they see it in a different way. Many people say, okay, so we can afford to fail seven stations. Yes, you can afford to fail those seven stations, but make sure if you're failing a station, uh, in simple words, I will say, fail with dignity. Don't fail with zero or one because it's difficult to compensate. Try to get as many marks as you can because that will be really good and difficult. It will be easy for you to pass and get good score. Uh, you know, once you have passed lab two, the score of uh, lab two doesn't matter. It doesn't matter you got 130 and you pass the exam, or you got 200 and you pass the exam. It doesn't matter because once you get GMC registration, the score will disappear from your account, from your GMC account. And if somebody asks, first of all, I'm saying nobody is going to ask you, but if somebody asks you how much you got in lab two, you can simply say yes, I got. 216 because nobody will be able to uh, access nobody will be able to find out how much do you get in in your plaf exam right <clears throat> so let's just see this uh, uh, passing criteria as well so passing criteria uh plaf to marking as we said as i told you like three domains we have got four is for data gathering four is for your interpersonal skill and four for your clinical management skills so we have got three domains data gathering what they are expecting they're expecting history taking physical examination practical procedures because we have got so many procedures like cannula like blood sampling and all so they might expect these things and investigations leading to the diagnosis so what happened they might give you some investigation results as well so you should be able to interpret like if lft like ast lt high if urea crat high what does it mean how it can affect the patient what are the things you need to explain it to the patient so this is what comes under data gathering right one we have got clinical management skill what do we understand by clinical management it's like how you approach to the station whether you establish a repo with the patient how you use open and close questions you know how to develop the repo this is very 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 important and a lot of people a lot of people they ask how we can make the repo see repo is simply making your patient comfortable how you make someone comfortable i would say listen to them carefully do not interrupt them if you interrupt they will not be comfortable with you right so do not interrupt and listen to them carefully because in our countries being a doctor what we do like if we are coming from asian african countries what we do we talk more we don't listen to our patient properly we talk we talk and we talk but here it is other way around make sure you develop the habit of listening that's very important 
and always go for open class question first open question and then definitely the patient is not giving enough information you can definitely definitely go for closed questions as well what do you mean by open question open questions patient can give you more information a closed question the answer is very one word yes no uh, patient presented to you with pain say chest pain and uh, uh, so what does it mean patient comes with chest pain doctor i've got chest pain and you ask uh, uh, what kind of pain it is doctor it's heavy chest uh, is it going anywhere yes doctor it's going to my left arm meaning it, these are the closed question i'm asking you should not do in that way because then you have to ask every single question and it's going to take a huge amount of time so what you should do instead of asking every single question do one thing ask them tell me more about your pain so when you ask very much open question tell me more about the pain they will be able to tell a lot of things the doctor have got this pain it's center of my chest it's going to my left arm and i feel somebody sitting on my chest uh, I, I took some paracetamol it helped me a bit meaning they will tell you lots and lots of information right so what we have to do we have to involve the patient demonstrate and uh, dem demonstrate our professionalism and uh, of course we need to take care of our ethical principle as well when we are giving the treatment plan the treatment plan we are giving it should be the latest one in accordance to the nice guidelines interpersonal skills <clears throat> what do we understand by interpersonal skills? interpersonal skills usually mean how you talk uh, formulating a diagnosis explaining something to the patient and formulating a management plan everything comes under interpersonal skills you know you need to know like how much time we need to spend on each criteria so we have got total eight minutes how much time interpersonal skills is something uh, you don't have to spend time from minute one till eight minute everything is your interpersonal skills how you interact how you talk how you are putting the questions in front of the patient that's your interpersonal skills but data gathering and clinical management so many candidates ask like how much time we should spend on data gathering how much time we should spend on clinical management in history staking stations so what do you think and you know inside the cubicle you have got only one thing you have got only a one bell which is after six minutes telling you two minutes left so that's the only thing you have got so many candidates say okay if you take history for six minutes will two minutes will be enough for my clinical management what do you think i don't think so because it is a four marks it's also for four marks so do you think you need to spend a bit more on management yes so maybe i would say four to five minutes for your data gathering and last three to four minutes is for your clinical management because clinical management has got lots of things uh, it, it, it's like you're making the diagnosis, you're explaining the diagnosis, explaining about investigation, management. Management is your medical management, your non medical management, your, your warning sign, your safety netting, your follow up. And patient will be having concern. Patient came to you, why? Because he has got some concern, of course. So, patient will be asking some questions to you. You need to answer those questions as well. So, all these things come under this particular thing. So, clinical management, two minutes won't be enough. Make sure you give a bit more, right? So maybe three to three minutes or maybe a bit more than that and of course it depends on the station as well in some station you might be giving three minutes in some station three and a half to four minutes as well but everything should be there in your mind nobody is going to tell you three minutes left or five minutes left only one bell will be there which will be telling you two minutes left right <clears throat> so this is the way they are going to give you the result so when you get your result these they are giving you two sheets this is the first one so what happened they will be giving you all 18 scenario in this way station 1 2 3 4 5 6 18 so these are all 18 scenarios plus uh, they will be dividing it in this way data gathering clinical management and interpersonal skills and uh, they will tell like uh, for example station 1 whatever station you got they will be writing the name of the station here make for example you got uh, chest pain so they'll be writing chest pain second station was say breaking bad news they'll be writing breaking breaking bad news the third one may be counseling so smoking counseling maybe so they'll be writing it in this way and they'll be telling us uh, in data gathering for uh, station one you got four in clinical management you got one and interpersonal skills you got four so they are going to tell they are going to give you the detailed result right and they will be giving you total score which is nine and there will be a passing score for each station the passing score will be different if you can see 7.9 7.15 8.12 7.23 7.2, it is different it is different it is different right so every station will be having its own passing score and this is a rough sheet don't think the passing score is 133.45 always no the passing score is roughly around 125 127 that's uh, 
the thing what we are seeing in last uh, few months actually right so every station will be having its own passing score right and you need to get above that passing score for example like in one station if you see here 7.9 it was the passing and you got 9 it means you pass the station right so this is how it goes uh, you know when examiner when they're giving you the score do you think they know whether they passed you or failed you actually no they don't know whether they have passed you whether they have failed you they don't know about this thing but you know uh, because it's a it, it's a relative marking they have to see how the candidates are performing and then accordingly they will give us uh, uh, I mean accordingly they will pass or fail so if nobody is doing well the passing score will go down if the station is new and uh, everybody they are doing okay okay performance not doing very well so don't worry there are high chances you'll pass the station in the new one why because it's not only new for you it's new for everyone and the passing score will go down so I mean don't lose your hope even if you get something new uh, the thing is we are going to tell you even if you get a new scenario it won't be a trouble for you we'll tell you how to tackle with the new scenario don't you worry about it but the thing is don't lose your hope be confident in those new station passing score will be low right but you know examiner they don't know whether they failed you or passed you but if they really like you what they do they give you very good mark they will give you 10 11 12 so that is definite pass and if you annoy the examiner somehow and um, they want to fail you so they will give one two three which is definitely fail but somehow if you get six seven eight nobody knows actually failed or passed it's the performance of other candidates which will decide you failed or you passed right so for example you will see like uh, first station nine then nine passing was 7.5 you pass you pass Sec third one 8.12 was passing you got six so you got fail right so if you see like you have to pass at least 11 so we have got one station two three four five six seven eight nine ten and eleven station we pass so total result it says pass that is how it works so overall score is 134 passing was 133.45 so we got more than that so one criteria was fulfilled and the second one was 11 station so we fulfilled that criteria as well that is how you get it in the exam right now one more thing uh, uh, they are giving four in data gathering four in interpersonal one in management why what's the problem where I was lacking in this they have given data gathering three where we were lacking so they are going to give you another sheet for your result that is your another sheet for the result it has got few columns as you see uh, consultation diagnosis examination finding issues language uh, listening management report time that is the thing so so what happened uh they will give you a tick these ticks are actually not good if you think that these ticks you, you did something well no uh these ticks will tell you where you were lacking right so in station one where we got nine we got one in management where was the problem our problem was in consultation our problem was in listening so these 10 domains are really important and they will tell you where you are lacking your consultation skill was not right there was some problem in the consultation and you were not listening properly to the patient that is why they didn't give us good marks for example if you see like uh, uh, any station you can pick any station you can pick if i'm picking for example this one station number 15 so where we are lacking we are lacking here in the examination where we are lacking we are lacking in the finding where we are lacking we are lacking in the listening column right so that is why they might not have given us 12 so you might be thinking why we didn't get 12 in that station because there was some problem there was some mistake done by us on these particular areas right <clears throat> so these are the feedback statements right so consultation repo management listening language time diagnosis examination finding and issues right let's discuss a bit in uh, like uh, not in full detail but just briefly about this consultation what do they understand by the term consultation what they are expecting from us in this uh, consultation uh, consultation is how you are talking how you are making a patient uh, feel okay during the consultation and Britishers you know what they like they like one thing pretty much they like smooth consultation they write they like smooth consultation uh, 
they don't like if it is fluctuating somewhere because when you do take history what happens you do take uh, uh, presenting complaint you elaborate that presenting complaint you have got past medical history personal history lifestyle social history this is how it works if you are making it in this way it's a very good smooth consultation you are not going to get the tick but however what happens is uh, if you're jumping from one part to another part you are in the present complaint and suddenly you just notice some questions from past medical history and you jump to past medical history and then suddenly you feel oh no no, no i have to come back to the present history go back to the present history and then going to the personal history coming back to the present history meaning what is happening you're jumping you're jumping all around so what happened they will give you a tick in the consultation because this is illogical consultation this is not a smooth consultation this is not in the sequence so make sure you always make a smooth consultation issues see when patient is coming to you definitely patient have got some issues right so many patient many candidates actually they ask me whether we should do medical management first or non medical management first what do you think should we do medical or non medical first see uh, i would say nobody can tell whether we should go for medical or non medical it depends on the patient it depends on the requirement of the patient uh, for example, like a patient is dying in front of you, patient is saying, I can't breathe, my, my asthma is killing me, I have shortness of breath. Patient is not able to talk and we are talking to him about, okay, do not smoke, do feel good physical exercise, this and that. Does that make sense? No, this is bullshit. This doesn't make any sense. We have to go for active treatment. We have to go for the medical treatment. We may be giving him oxygen and some active plan of treatment. So the thing is, we have to see the patient. On the other hand, you have got a case which is a, a diabetic case, which is a maybe high cholesterol or high, hypertension case. There you can definitely go for uh, the non-medical management first, and then you can discuss the medical management as well. So see the scenario, and accordingly you will do the things. Right. So. In case like if you're giving health and lifestyle advices to acutely ill patient, that is going to affect your marking very badly. So be very careful in that regard, right? Finding. So we have to find something. There are lots of things that you will see. You have to find them. Uh, like you will see <clears throat> finding in terms of history taking. They will be giving you some proper life positive finding. You should be able to get those things from the patient. You will be uh, getting some investigation finding as well. You should be able to interpret those. You will be getting some examination finding as well sometime from the examiner. So you should be able to interpret that thing that will be coming under finding. If you fail to do so, they will give you a ticket the finding. Examination, some of the station you will see you have to do proper examination, right? And uh, they, will, they will see how you are talking to the patient, how you are behaving, how you are touching the patient. Are you giving any pain to the patient? How you are handling the instrument? Are you handling the instrument proficiently or not? So all these things will be taken care of in this uh, column of examination. If you're not taking care of these things, you might get a tick in the examination column as well, right? Another one we have got diagnosis. So what do we understand by this uh, diagnosis? Are you supposed to make the diagnosis in all the station? Can you make the diagnosis in all the station? Maybe yes, maybe not. It's not that easy. I mean, just only on the basis of history, it's sometimes not easy just to make the diagnosis. You may be needing lots of other things as well, examination, investigation results as well. So if you can make the diagnosis, it's fine. If not, if not, don't panic, don't panic. What you need to do, go for differential, differential diagnosis. I mean, <clears throat> we are human, we are, uh, and uh, it's not like possible for us to make the diagnosis only on the basis of history. If you can, give it if you cannot then give your differential i mean patient is coming to us with cough and shortness of breath we know there is something wrong from the respiratory part something from the lungs but we don't know exact the diagnosis so what you should do john where we have uh, done uh, your history examination but uh, uh, there's some something wrong with your uh, chest we are not able to find out what exactly it is so what we need to do we need to do some further investigation you mentioned about further investigation and this is how it works and tell <clears throat> your further plan of management like we are going to do blood tests we're going to do chest x-ray abg and all those things you need to do for that particular station right <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> <clears throat> Just a sec. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's our uh, diagnosis. So make sure if you're not able to make the diagnosis, you will be giving the differential diagnosis. Then we have got time. Time is also very important as we have already discussed. You have got eight minutes and you have to divide uh, uh, attention to all the domains and you need to cover uh, data gathering, management, everything. Right, so make sure uh, you put your time accordingly. Language. See, language is uh, very, very important. Uh, you have to use the word which patients can understand. That's really important. If you're using medical jargons, that will not be making any sense for the patient. Uh, you are just talking in medical language. Patient is like, okay, fine. I'm not getting it though. So what you need to do, make sure you are coming to the level of the patient. You're talking in that language where patient can understand. That is really, really important. Listening, be a very good listener. I've told you already, like in our countries, we are more prone to go for active part. We just talk, 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 and we don't listen to our patient carefully. But here it is other thing, other way around. Make sure you listen to them carefully. You listen to them carefully and talk less, listen more. That is, uh, I would say, you can do in PLAP2. Will be very, very helpful. Management, as we know, what GMC says, uh, General Medical Council says the management, it includes a warning sign for safety netting and it includes follow up. See, so don't miss these things. These two things never miss. This is pretty, pretty important. Warning sign. Warning sign you'll be having for every station. For example, patient is coming to you with chest pain and, and you found out it is simple musculoskeletal pain. So a uh, patient is worried about heart attack so you can give him the warning sign of heart attack john if you again if you get this kind of chest pain and you feel that your chest is heavy you are sweating and you're going to your arm and to your jaw please make sure you come back to the hospital and always do follow up with us so that's your warning sign and follow up right so please do follow up always and if your condition gets worse come back to us that's your warning sign and follow up this is how you should be doing it <clears throat> Repo building. See, repo building is really, really important. It's like how much empathetic you are, how you are talking to the patient properly. Are you listening to them properly or not? Are you giving undivided attention to them or not? Uh, you know, sometimes patients will be talking, talking, and talking. They're talking too much. How you will tell them that I'm listening to you? You just know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the way to show that I'm actively listening to you. I know you might be listening to them just by sitting like this. But the thing is patient, how you will tell the patient indirectly without interrupting them that I'm listening to you. So this is something very, very important and be very careful on this particular area. <clears throat> so the question, what kind of questions you are going to get? So you're going to get the question in this way. This is a sample question. Uh, you can find this question on the GMC website as well. Uh, the question will be divided actually in these five headings, where you are, who the patient is, other information, what you must do, and special note. You know, when they divide the question in five different areas, you will see it's very easy for you to understand and retain that information because you are going to have one and a half minute to read this task. Uh, the same task, uh, which is outside, you will see it inside as well. If you want to have a look again inside the cubicle, you can do that. That's not a big deal. Right, and don't think task will be of just very like one line. Sometimes you see ethical scenarios and all, they're quite lengthy. So one and a half minute might be tricky situation for you. Right, so be careful on this particular regard. So every single thing, every single point is really important. Where you are, you are FY2 doctor in rheumatology unit. FY2 is internship and all the station you will see, you will be FY2. It simply means you are a junior doctor. So the plan of management, everything you are giving, you are doing, they are expected, you are expected to give in the capacity of a junior doctor. So, you know, if you are a consultant or if you are a resident, senior resident in any of the department, be very careful in PLAP2. We know like many people, there was um, one surgeon from, uh, uh, from one of the Asian countries uh, in our academy and he failed one of the surgical station. And he was very surprised, like, how can they fail me in surgical station? I mean... It was testicular examination to be pretty precise. And he said, I'm, I'm doing like daily 10 testicular examination in my clinic and how can I fail it? Because you know what happened? If you're a specialist in one field, you know too much about that particular thing and you tend to tell everything to the patient. You tend to tell everything and it might not be 
required in that station and they don't want you to go out of your state your state is fy2 so don't go out of it don't show that i'm a consultant show i'm a bloody junior doctor that's it so fy2 in all the station and they will tell you which department you are in is it important to know yes it's really important because your plan of action will be according to that if you are in a &E, your plan of action is uh, uh, according to that if you're in psychiatry your plan of action is according to that so it's very important to know which department you are in right now we have got a patient stainless smith age 45 has been referred by the gp with the pain in the right big toe so in this thing who the patient is they are going to tell you briefly about the case so you can make up your mind outside as well like uh, the station has uh, patient has got pain in in the right big toe okay so patient has got pain in the right big toe so you are having few things you have got gout you have got cellulitis maybe trauma simply so you are having few things arthritis kind of thing so you are having lots of things in your mind and you're thinking okay when i go inside i'm gonna rule it out i'm gonna rule out all those things that is the mindset that you have got isn't it so this is how it works but nowadays what they are doing they're also becoming smart i mean who i'm talking about i'm talking about uh, gmc so what they are doing nowadays uh, they're putting the question in this way stainless smith age 45 has been referred to uh, referred by the gp because of some problem so meaning they're not giving us much of the information they're simply saying because of some problem and we're like which problem i mean but they're not telling us sometimes so they don't want you to make up your mind outside the cubicle they just want you to go in and do it and think your differential inside the cubicle itself other information so they might give you some other information as well other information meaning uh, like patient is diabetic patient is hypertensive so this is what we call about uh, other information sometimes they don't want to give you other information they will simply write none what you must do talk to the patient assess him and discuss the management with the patient or with the examiner so this is very very important you should know the management plan is it with the patient or with the examiner if it is with the patient and you are doing it with the examiner you are not going to get any mark and vice versa as well so please read the task carefully they are going to give you either with the patient or with the examiner and you are going to proceed accordingly right special note Sometimes they'll say none. Sometimes they will give you some special note. Patient is worried. Patient is anxious. Patient is angry. Consent has been taken. For example, if you're talking to someone else, they might say consent has been taken. Uh, for example, you're dealing with a pediatric case. They might say a child is not in the cubicle. So these kind of things you may expect in the column of uh, special note. Right. So all the questions that you're going to get in PLAB 2 will be according to this. Right. <clears throat> okay so there are a few things you must have to do in the exam very very important first is read the question carefully read the question carefully because many times we have seen candidates why they are not able to get good marks why they fail the station the reason being they don't read the task carefully they think okay oh this is the same task i have read no they might have changed one word and everything will change so make sure you read the task carefully don't assume it's the same task please 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 read it carefully do not interrupt the patient you know in our countries as i told you we talk more we don't let our patient talk but here your patient will talk and you have to listen please listen to them carefully please do not do not do not interrupt them uh, acknowledge the emotion that is very very important always you need to acknowledge for example one of the patient is angry patient is angry patient is shouting on you i know in your country no one can shout on you you are the one who shouts on the patient but here patient can shout so if patient is shouting actually he is showing us anger it is kind of a cue there is verbal cue there is non verbal cue non verbal is like patient is not telling i'm angry patient is showing that i'm angry so you need to acknowledge the emotion once patient is done patient is done so then you start talking you say i can see you are angry i can see you are upset you know you have to say that thing in words you cannot say calm down patient will become more angry if you say calm down it is the patient's wish what patient wants to do it is his wish if he wants to calm down he will but if he doesn't want to he will continue to be angry but what is your job how you can make him calm down is by acknowledging the emotion by saying i can see you are angry i can see you are upset if patient is anxious i can see you are anxious patient is worried for example i can see you are worried i can see you are uh, i mean you are embarrassed i can see 
uh, you're not comfortable is there anything i can do for you to make you more comfortable so these are the things these are the acknowledgement of the emotions right pretty important be honest and be yourself that's very important be honest uh, many times you will see you'll come across a question you don't know the answer so what to do i don't know i'm not sure i'll talk to my senior i'll get back to you so what i did i'm being very honest and be yourself you know try not to follow anyone that's something a lot of people a lot of candidates they do this mistake they try to follow someone don't try to follow anyone don't try to follow anyone be yourself they don't want to see anyone in on in you they want to see you right communication is the key communication is the key to pass plab two they have checked your medical knowledge in plab one you have shown your plab one knowledge yesterday you got the result but the thing is uh, uh here in plab two mostly the communication is the key communication is the key and open and close question you have to put in a nice way uh, open always and then you can ask close questions right now these two things painkillers are you comfortable to talk see patient comes to you and patient says i'm in pain so how you should start the station do you think patient will be able to talk to you for eight minutes maybe yes maybe not so ask when patient how can i help you patient oh doctor i'm in pain are you comfortable to talk are you comfortable to talk patient may say yes then you continue with your history tell me more about your pain if patient says no then what you should do you should ask further you want any painkiller do you want any painkiller if patient says yes doctor so what to do ask the examiner I'm examiner i would like to give painkillers to my patient after ruling out allergies and contraindications that's something you can do but you know in some of the station you will see it is not a good idea to give painkillers in the beginning of the station because it might be examination station and if you give painkillers in the beginning you will mask the finding and later on you might not get uh, the desired finding so be very careful see the station if you have to do examination tell the patient yes i'll give you painkiller but let me examine you first so in that way you're telling the patient i will give you but when after doing the examinations so examiner also got the idea like you know the concept but in some station where you feel like yeah i can give painkillers so maybe you can mention by telling it to the examiner that i want to give painkillers after ruling out allergies and contraindication right so this is very very important <clears throat> Always, you know, in PLAP2, what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to make a two-way conversation. You're supposed to make a two-way conversation always. You know, when you're taking history, when you're doing history taking, what is happening? Your patient is giving you answer. You're asking question, patient is giving you the answer. So ultimately, it is a two-way conversation. You are asking, they're answering. Perfectly fine, no problem at all. Uh, if they are not talking, usually what happens when in the management plan when you are in the management you will see you are the one who is talking and patient is just listening that will not make much sense you always have to maintain two-way conversation your examiner wants to hear two voices during history taking you are talking he's also talking it is two-way conversation but in the management what's happening you are the one who is talking that is not gonna help you that is not gonna help you in any way so what you need to do you need to do something like this you need to ask you need to involve them in talking uh, how does that sound are you with me are we still together are you getting me are you keeping up with me are we still on the same page so in this way what patient will say if you say uh, are we still together oh yeah yeah doctor i'm, I'm, I'm fine i can uh, i can uh, make up what you're saying yeah it's fine yeah please continue so what's happening patient is uh, with us you know in management plan you say a few lines one two three lines you give a pause why you give the pause so that patient time it's a patient time if patient wants to ask some question he can ask you that is what we are doing when we are giving this pause and if you see patient is not talking at all you are struggling so what you do you use maybe one of these phrases you will see it might be helpful in your exam right and what else you're supposed to do you have to keep the patient involved in the conversation you need to let the patient ask a question you need to pick the verbal and non-verbal cues see verbal cues is very easy doctor i'm in pain you can pick it no worries but non-verbal cues sometimes becomes really important and difficult to pick up what does it mean it means uh, patient is shaking his leg 
patient shaking her leg, for example, it's a thyroid station, hyperthyroid, and you know patient will be anxious. And uh, this is a finding, shaking the leg is a finding. So when you acknowledge it, I can see, you know, I mean, Mari, I can see you're shaking your leg, is everything all right? So what do you think, what do you see, patient will calm down? And you know, that's a finding, that's a known verbal cue that you have picked up. And you will see the difference in your marking, you'll get good marks. So be very careful, don't miss any of the known verbal cue. Go slow and don't rush. I know like you might be thinking we have got eight minutes, we have to rush. No, don't rush the patient. You know, if you're doing well, your patient, your examiner, everyone will help you. You have eight minutes, you know, they also know you have eight minutes. So it will be helpful, don't worry. And as we have already told, don't answer if you're not sure. If you're not sure about the answer, say, I don't know. Be very honest, right? <clears throat> So history and communication skills, uh, let's see. Uh, briefly, we're not going to go in uh, any of these uh, details today. Uh, greet with a smiley face. You know, this smiley face will do wonders, will do a lot of things. I'm not saying if it is a breaking bad news station, you are smiling, that will not make much sense. But other station, like if it's a history station, it's a counseling station, examination station, there is no harm in if you give a bit of smile. It's really gonna help. If a patient met with a doctor who is happy, smiling, cheerful, patient will feel relieved. Patient will feel uh, more confidence in you as well. So what you need to do, you need to show the confidence. Yeah, smile face. So greet them with a smiley face, right? And shaking hand, you can shake hand with them if you want. If you're not comfortable, don't do it. But if you're doing shaking hand, make sure you are comfortable, you are confident. It doesn't mean your hand is, hello, I can help you. I mean, your voice is shaking, your hand is shaking. That is not going to give you mark. So be very, very careful on this particular regard as well. Introduce and identify the patient then. So greet the patient with smiley face and then introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Ankur, one of the doctors here. And you identify the patient. Could you please confirm your name? Right, see the name of the patient will be written outside as well. I've shown you the question, how they are going to give you the question. So the thing is, uh, the question is there outside. So the name of the patient is there. So you can use the name which is given to you outside or you can ask, you can confirm it again. It is entirely up to you how you wanna go. Don't, no hard and fast rule, right? So, hello, I'm Ankur, one of the doctors here. May I confirm your name? Yeah, I'm John Smith. Uh, hello, what would you like me to call you? So, if they are giving you both the name, for example, the name of the patient is John Smith. So, when you say, could you please confirm your name? He said, yeah, I'm John Smith. Now, it is difficult for you to go with John Smith all the time. You need John or you need Mr. Smith. So, ask them, what would you, what you, what would you like me to call you? You can call me John. Hello, John, nice to meet you. And if they say, you can call me Mr. Smith. Hello, Mr. Smith, nice to meet you. John is John, Smith is Mr. Smith. That is what I wanna say. Mr. John doesn't make any sense. It's John or it's Mr. Smith. That is how you should go. When you start the consultation saying, what brings you to the hospital? How can I help you? And that's it. And this is how you will proceed in the conversation, right? So history taking, you know, when you do history taking, what happens? You have got your presenting complaint, uh, say pain or whatever, and then you have got history of presenting complaint, right? You elaborate that presenting complaint. Patient has got chest pain, so what do you do? You elaborate that chest complaint. Tell me more about pain. Once you have elaborated just chest pain, what you do? You ask anything else. You ask anything else. Like if patient has got any other symptom with chest pain, Right, so if patient has got cough as well. So what you do, you elaborate this cough. So this is the way you need to be doing it. So once you are done with all the presenting complaint, you have elaborated all the presenting complaint, what you will see, you will see, you will be able to make a provisional diagnosis and you need to ask associated symptoms for that. For example, you got chest pain going to the arm, going to the jaw, patient has got dry cough as well, patient has got sweating as well. So what do you think? It is going towards ACS, right? So what do you do? You ask other, other questions of ACS as well. You ask about tiredness, you ask about nausea, vomiting, sweating, and that's how you make the diagnosis. Plus what you do, once you have asked associated symptom, you ask a differential diagnosis as well. Chest pain can have so many differential. So make sure you ask few differential here and rule out those differential. And the differential that you're ruling out, make sure these differential are emergencies. These differential are killers. If you don't rule these out, patient might be dead. So make sure you're ruling out 
very very important differentiation after that you have got your past medical history you have got your personal history or i would say lifestyle history and you have got social history as well right so let's think let's go a bit more in detail bit more not too much no worries i'm not going to take much of your time see presenting complaint might be pain presenting complaint might be dizziness might be cough might be shortness of breath so we have got the mnemonics for everything if the presenting complaint is pain we use socrates we use socrates and if the presenting complaint is something else we use od para because see socrates is site onset character radiation associated symptoms uh, time uh, exacerbating and relieving factors and severity of the pain right so we tell the patient to score it but we cannot uh, score cough we cannot score dizziness so that's why we have got another mnemonic that is what we say od para right so it's almost the same just a slight difference will be there in these uh, thing and in your country you might be having your own mnemonic you can use it's not like you definitely have to use this mnemonic the thing is what we want we want everything to be elaborated in a proper way that's the thing right so what we have got for socrates so for example sight do you think sight of the pain is important it's really important to know because sight of the pain will be telling you lots of differential patient has got back pain so sight we should be very much careful where exactly in the back is it upper back or lower back you should be going it in detail upper back pain different differential lower back pain it is different so your differential will be different you can narrow down your differential on the basis of sight and it will be helping you in narrowing down your differential onset is very important is it sudden is it gradual it is important yes it is very important sudden sudden headache first headache sh sudden chest pain acs gradual oh, i have got this gradual joint pain maybe arthritis so that is the thing onset of the pain will be really really helpful also you can ask in onset what were you doing when you started having this pain so for example patient got back pain and you know patient told you doctor i was uh, moving heavy object checks in the factory and after that i started having this back pain so what do you know it is disc prolapse that thing the onset was during the work so that is going to give you a lot of things yeah ask about the pain is it intermittent is it continuous that is very important if it is intermittent uh, comes and goes comes and goes how often it comes and when it comes how long it stays that is what you need to ask make sure whatever it is you go into detail of it you do full post mortem of that particular finding right we have got character so character is also important so you ask what kind of pain it is patient has got heavy chest patient has got dull pain maybe in the flank that is for pyelonephritis so that is uh, very important radiation doctor i have got chest pain going to my arm going to my jaw you know it is acs you can ask for shifting pain as well for example uh, patient said doctor i have got pain in the right iliac fossa okay right iliac fossa again it has got so many differential but you want to rule out appendicitis you ask where was the pain when it started doctor it was in the right iliac fossa and still it is in the right iliac fossa so you know it is not appendicitis because appendicitis pain starts from where it start from the umbilicus and then goes to the right iliac fossa right so this is very important meaning socrates every single thing is very 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 important right you can ask about any associated symptoms the patient has got time is very important like uh, you can ask uh, when when this uh, thing started meaning does it happen more often in the morning time like morning headache morning vomiting is sol like uh, space occupying lesions that's very important ask about exacerbating and relieving factors is there anything makes it better is there anything makes it worse maybe patient tells you doctor i'm taking some paracetamol it helps a bit how many paracetamol did you take does it help all these thing i mean you need to go it in detail right that's the only thing patient has got chest pain doctor if i'm bending forward it gets better chest pain getting better on bending forward pericarditis so you know these kind of things uh, will help you a lot in making up your diagnosis all right so this is uh what you have to do uh severity so severity is also very important like you can ask because the treatment plan you have to do so severity is very important so you should be asking uh, on a scale of 1 to 10 uh, what's the severity score right so accordingly you can offer painkillers as well right so that's your socrates for pain
And uh, then again, the same way you can use ODPAR as well if the presenting complaint is a cough, if the presenting complaint is shortness of breath. So you can ask about uh, the onset, the duration, the intensity, the progression, aggravating and relieving factor, and associated symptom with cough, associated symptom with the shortness of breath. So that's your ODPARA. So this is Socrates and ODPARA, very important in terms of history taking, right? So past medical history, let's come back, uh, let's come to the past medical history. So we have done our presenting complaint, we have elaborated the presenting complaint, now we are in the past medical history. So past medical history has got few points. Uh, previous similar episode, medical illness, medication, allergy, hospital stay, surgery, family history. All questions are really, really important. And make sure whatever you get positive, you go it in detail. Previous similar episode, ask, has this happened before? Patient presented to you with anything, patient presented to you with cough, patient presented to you with chest, ask, is it the first time or has it happened before? If patient says yes, patient had chest pain and patient said yes, I ha it, it has happened before as well. So ask in detail, so what was it? Did you go to the hospital? What did the doctor say? Did you get admitted? And what kind of treatment you got? So maybe patient was having previously angina and the doctor was just given some medication and discharged the patient. So you will be able to make the diagnosis of chest pain this time very easily because you already have something in the past medical history. Right, then you will be definitely asking about the medical illness as well. Have you been diagnosed with any medical condition? Have you ever been diagnosed with any medical condition? It's very important and you can ask for some medical conditions as well. For example, like uh, if you want, uh, if you are dealing with chest pain and you know diabetes, uh, your high blood pressure, your cholesterol, all these are the risk factor in chest pain. So you can ask specifically as well. Have you ever been diagnosed with any medical condition? No doctor, by any chance and diabetes, no any high blood pressure, no high cholesterol, no. So you can ask these things. You'll see this is really, really important. Medication is important. Are you taking any medication regularly? Any medication including over-the-counter and her herbal remedies? Are you taking any medication including over-the-counter and herbal remedies? Right, because over-the-counter medication and herbal, it's very important because many patients, they're taking herbal medication thinking herbal medication are the safest medication. See, the thing is herbal medication can have side effects as well. Many of the herbal medication, you don't know what is the content, how it works, what's the interaction. So we cannot just say they are the safest medication, right? So we have to be very, very careful on this bit. Also, we need to ask for OTC as well, over-the-counter medication. That's also very important. Maybe patient is taking some painkillers over the counter and uh, might not be thinking it is something very important for me to tell it to the tell, tell it to the doctor, but no, it's really important. So make sure in your question, you're covering OTC and herbal medication for sure, right? Allergies is very important. Do you have any allergies? That's very important to know about the allergy. Why it is important? Because uh, maybe you are giving some antibiotics uh, to the patients. That's very important. Um, a patient is allergic to something. Patient is allergic to penicillin and drug of choice is also penicillin. So you should be very, very aware of these things. Maybe patient is allergic to some food. Maybe a patient is allergic to some environment, some dust, some pollen and all those kind of things. So make sure you ask and you cover it in allergies. Hospital stay, have you ever been hospitalized? If patient says yes, you again go into detail of it. Surgeries, have you had any surgery? Yes, doctor, what surgery? What was the experience in the hospital? Did you experience any kind of complication last time? Family history, family history is also very important, right? Um, like uh, anyone in the family having the same complaint because patient is coming to the hospital, coming to you with chest pain and ask if there anyone in the family having the chest pain. So he said, yes, my father had heart attack when uh, uh, he was in his 50s. So we need to know about the age group as well. Father got heart attack at what age? That's very important. If father got heart attack at the age of 55, so this patient is also prone to have heart attack during the same age. That's very important, meaning family history is also really, really important. Now comes to the lifestyle questions or personal history. That's very important. You know, uh, smoking is, uh, you can ask uh, alcohol, you can ask diet, physical activity, stress, recreational and sexual history. Very, very, very important questions. And you know, before you ask uh, personal history, you can do signposting as well. That's very important. See, PLAP2 is about, uh, see, PLAP2 is uh, not like uh, what to do. You know what to do. You know what to say, that's not PLAP2. What to do, what to say, you know that thing, you don't need to know. What you need to know is how to say the thing. 
that is plus two. How to say the things? So that's very important. So when you ask personal question, you might be doing sign posting. Meaning, let me ask you, John. Let me ask you a few questions about your lifestyle. You're smoking alcohol. That might give me better insight into your problem. So tell me, do you smoke? That's very much important because you are preparing the patient that I'm going to ask you some question which might be related to your smoking alcohol because patient came to you patient might be thinking I have got chest pain and this doctor is asking me about smoking alcohol. What does it mean? I mean, how does it relate to each other? So you have to show them the relationship that now I'm going to ask you this question. Don't feel awkward and these are the routine question we ask from everyone because these questions are related to somehow to your problem, right? ask for all these things do you smoke and make sure you elaborate everything do you smoke yes doctor what do you smoke how much do you smoke since when you have been smoking how often do you smoke so you need to go it in detail and you know many candidates assume that patient is smoking cigarettes that's not the thing when you ask do you smoke yes doctor how many cigarettes and the patient is like cigarette I don't I don't smoke cigarette then what does what else you smoke I smoke shisha maybe so it depends it depends right and nowadays you know they are using one more thing be very careful do you smoke no doctor I wave they are saying I wave what does it mean it means e-cigarette they are using e-cigarette so you should be aware of few uh, British words as well I mean proper English word wave doctor I don't smoke but I wave wave is e-cigarette so you should be aware of it alcohol do you drink alcohol what alcohol which alcohol do you drink how often how much how often since when you need to elaborate alcohol as well right and 14 units you can drink 14 units uh, in a week make sure you have got two alcohol free days and you can drink 14 that's okay according to the NHS right diet tell me about your diet right and ask do you include fruits and vegetables in your diet or not that's pretty important exercise do you exercise a lot are you physically active that's very important stress do you have any stress in your life see they will say oh doctor everyone has got stress yes i'm asking about do you have any stress uh, relates to your family or your maybe your business no doctor nothing like that then recreational drug you need to go in detail of recreational drug as well you take recreational drug it's the same like uh, which drug do you take uh, how often do you take and since how long you have been taking and one very important question how do you take it how do you take it meaning we are interested if the patient is injecting it or not that's our main aim here because if patient is injecting we need to ask about few more things do you share needle do you share needle or not? That's very important because we are worried about the needle bone infection. We are worried about HIV hepatitis. So these are the things which are really, really important, right? Sexual history need to go in detail of sexual history as well. Are you sexually active? Are you in stable relationship? Do you have any other partner? When was the last time you had unprotected sex? Do you use sex toys? what is your sexual preference what's the root of the sex sex uh, root means uh, anal vaginal oral uh, whether you had any previous sti or pid you can ask all those things you know first of all make sure you don't hesitate while you ask sexual history and uh, detailed sexual history is must in few cases like if it is a pid if it is a chive if it is hepatitis b if it is mimocystic carina pneumonia in these kind of station detailed sexual history must be there because that is the thing main thing which will be helpful in coming up to the diagnosis right so be very careful on this regard we have got social history as well uh, where we ask about the travel history that's very important where did you travel to have you ever traveled recently yes uh, where which country baby patient had traveled to something which is epidemic area in that country in that area patient got some infection so that's very very important occupation is very important what do you do for the living that's very important to know isn't it uh, for example like patient is working in aniline dye factory we are thinking about bladder cancer so aniline dye factory is very very important uh, for example, asbestos, asbestos industry. For example, we're thinking about lung cancer. We're thinking about mesothelioma and patient says, yes, I'm working in asbestos factory. So it's very, very important risk factor for you. Living conditions, very important. How's your home living condition? That's very, very important for us to know about the home living condition because uh, if patient is living in congested environment, so they are prone to have some kind of infections as well, like uh, tuberculosis, if they're living in hostel and all that. 
right and in, not in all cases but some cases you can ask about uh, view drive as well because you might be telling the patient to inform DVLA driving vehicle licensing uh, agency because uh, if patient has got some eye problem they have got some problem with their ears they have got uh, MI a heart attack they have got uh, uh, strokes so in these kind of uh, diabetes so these are the condition where uh, we need to tell the patient to inform DVLA as well. So not in all cases, but in some cases, you can ask about the driving status of the patient as well, right? So summary, if I have to say, summary is uh, we start with the how can I help you? That's a pretty much open question, right? You elaborate the question like patient said, I've got chest pain. What do you say? Tell me more about it. Tell me more about it. That's also an open question you're asking. So patient has told you a lot of things. What patient hasn't told you, what you do? You ask a close question. For example, you are having pain as presenting complaint and you're doing your Socrates. Patient has told you three, four answers for Socrates, but patient hasn't told you the full Socrates. So what do you do in that case? Uh, rest of thing which is left, you ask by asking close question, as simple as that. Then again, you ask anything else, open question, patient tells you some other finding as well. Make sure you elaborate it simply. Tell me more. Patient told you after chest pain, patient told you I have got cough as well. Tell me more about cough. And you elaborate. How you elaborate? You have got your odipara. After that, you ask anything else. Patient says no. Then you can ask associated symptoms to confirm your diagnosis and rule out few differential. As simple as that. So two questions are very important in uh, taking history. Tell me more and anything else. Don't forget these two very simple question and you will see your life will be very easy whenever you're doing any of the history taking right okay so after that you know we have done this past medical history question previous similar episode medical illness medication allergy hospital stay surgery family history personal we have done smoking alcohol diet physical activity stress recreational drug sexual history we have done travel history occupation living condition so we have just asked all these things in sequence you know once you're done with your history taking you can ask one more thing is there anything else that I should know? You know, if you have got a good rapport with your patient and you are missing something, you know, your patient will help you and will tell you that thing. Take my words, your patient will tell you that thing for sure. So if you're missing something, ask, is there anything else I should know? That's really important. Patient's concern is very important. Make sure you are addressing all the concerns of the patient and impact of the illness on the patient life. See, in, in, in PLAP2, in the UK, it's not only you're doing the medical treatment. You have to see other things as well. Uh, what is the impact of this illness on the patient's life? That is really, really important. For example, patient has got uh, tiredness and it's going on for the last three, four months. You need to know how this illness, how this tiredness has affected your day-to-day -day life. Patient might be telling you, doctor, now I'm not uh, able to help out my wife. Now I'm not able to help uh, my children in their homework and all. So that's also the thing which is very important. We need to address that as well. So make sure if patient has got any chronic illness, you are going to put some stress on this thing as well. Impact of the patient's illness on the patient's life. That's really important for us to do, right? Uh, what else we have got? Uh, I know like it might be quite lengthy, but don't worry, I'm not gonna take uh, 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 much of your time. So don't you worry, yeah? Uh, just last uh, two or three slides left. So after you are done with your history taking, what you do? We have to disclose and add, explain the diagnosis. But before that, in PLAP2, what you should do, you mention about the examination and initial investigation. You mention about your examination and initial investigation. So examination will be your general physical examination. We can uh, mention about the vitals and you can mention maybe chest examination. You can mention about heart examination. And depending on the station, I mean, if you're dealing with chest pain, you can mention this. If you're dealing with the abdominal diarrhea constipation, you can say abdominal examination, right? And then initial investigation. You can mention about routine blood investigation. We can mention about the x-ray of any area. You can mention about the ECG. You can mention about uh, the urine depth. We are mentioning about the routine investigations, right? Because, you know, a patient came to you with chest pain. You're thinking it is ACS, you're thinking it is MI, but don't you think if you have got the findings, few findings like the ECG, 
and there are some changes in the ECG, now you will be in a better position to say that you have got MI. Patient is presenting to you with burning sensation in the micturition. Before you say it's UTI, if you have got urine dip finding, and in urine dip finding, you have got leukocytes, you have got nitrates positive. You think will that make more sense or more importance? Yes, definitely yes. So, so, so that's the thing I'm saying. I mean, you can actually work on these things for sure, right? So before you give the diagnosis, make sure you mention about the examination and you mention about the initial investigations. This is really, really important. And on the basis of this, because sometimes you will see your examiner will give you this finding. Yes? It will give you the finding of examination and initial investigation. And on the basis of that, you will see it's very easy for you to come up to the diagnosis, right? And of course, don't forget to do the ice. What is ice? Ice is idea, concern, expectation. Idea, concern, expectation. You know, uh, this is something which is very important. You know, when you're doing uh, the scenarios and uh, you have uh, taken the history and you come up to a diagnosis that it, you, it looks like, say, lung cancer. So do you, Think you can tell straight away to the patient you have got lung cancer. I mean, you haven't done any of the investigation. You have done only basic investigation. You haven't done any like uh, detailed investigation, say bronchoscopy or uh, a CT scan and all. Before doing all those things, being a capacity of a junior doctor, do you think can you say it's lung cancer? But you know, you have to tell. You have to disclose it somehow. So how to do it? It is better to do it with eyes. Idea, check the idea of the patient because before you, before the patient came to you, they might have some idea. They might, they might have Googled it and they might know what exactly is happening with me, isn't it? So, what needs to be done? You need to say, uh, John, you came to me, you told you have got cough, you have got blood in your phlegm, you're losing weight, you're not enjoying your food these days, uh, and uh, we have done the chest x-ray and found there is a shadow, round shadow in your left side of the lung. Do you have any idea what's going on with you? So patient might be saying, oh, is it something serious, doctor? You ask, are you concerned about any particular thing? Doctor, is it cancer? John, this is one of the possibility. We need to rule it out. We need to do some further investigation. Patient will be having lots of things. Oh, is it cancer? Am I going to die? How much time I have? What is going to happen to my family? So what I mean is patient will be having lots and lots of concern. That's something. So what needs to be done? I mean, uh, do I and tell, see, John, we are not sure if it is cancer or not. We have just a suspicion. We need to investigate and we have to be sure what exactly is happening. Even if it is turn out, turning out to be cancer, we can offer you lots of treatment plan. But let's take one step at a time. Let's investigate it first. I mean, you know, this ice can be done in all the station, but specifically when you're dealing with some breaking bad news or dealing with some big uh, diagnosis, say cancer, do not miss this ice. You will see this ice is really, really, really important. Please do not miss it. And you know, if you are getting a new station, for example, we have seen like our lot of candidates, they mentioned that this ice was very much helpful. Um, if, if, if you're not sure what's the diagnosis, ask them, do you have any idea what's going on? They might help you out. For example, like uh, there is a case of eczema and uh, they sh they've shown you a skin picture and all and you are somehow okay that it looks like eczema but you're not sure. So when you do, do you have any idea what's going on? Yeah, doctor, do you think it's eczema? And you're like, eczema? So, so why do you think it's eczema? You know, doctor, his father also has got eczema. I mean, child was diagnosed with eczema. So his mother is saying the father also also got eczema. So what do you know? I mean, they helped you in this particular thing, meaning they are there to help you out. And it's always good to do ice because this ice will solve lots of mysteries, right? So ice, and after that, you can discl uh, disclose and explain the diagnosis to the patient, right? Explain the examination and investigation findings as well, because you have done the examination and investigation find investigations here. And if you got some finding, make sure after explaining the, the diagnosis, you explain those examination and investigation results also to the patient. And you mention about the further investigation, because here we are doing only routine investigation, but if you're supposed to do some further investigation, you can mention it here. For example, if you are supposed to do bronchoscopy or supposed to do CT scan for lung cancer, you can mention it here right and then it comes to the treatment you can mention about the treatment make sure you are not missing and never missing symptomatic treatment symptomatic treatment is must 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 and then uh, 
you can mention a specific treatment specific treatment will be medical treatment and non-medical treatment and you will decide whether medical treatment should be done first or non-medical should be done first it depends on the patient isn't it if you feel it's an emergency acute condition you go for medical treatment and if it is a counseling station you can go for non-medical guidelines first and then you can go for medical treatment you need to see whether you are going to admit the patient or not and don't follow don't forget the follow-up and warning sign right follow-up is occupational therapist and physiotherapist see occupational therapist who are these occupational therapists they are our colleague they help out the patient in many ways for example you have done the surgery now you're discharging the patient you have done uh, say <clears throat> hemiarthroplasty and you know after hemiarthroplasty you don't expect the patient to be normal again as soon as after the surgery and do you think patient can climb stairs it's not that easy for the patient to climb stairs patient will be struggling of course uh, so we won't we want to make the things easier for the patient we want to make sure all the facilities are at one floor so patient doesn't have to climb stairs but if the patient is living in a house where the stairs are there and all the facilities are not at one floor so what to do so our occupational therapist people they help them out in somehow uh, they might be putting a lift in the house they might be putting a, a ramp with the electrical chair something like that so they make some arrangements and they make the house very much uh, comfortable and easy to live for that particular patient right and we can give the warning sign make sure you give warning sign to all the patient and you can definitely offer leaflets and pamphlets to the patient that's very very important to offer leaflets and pamphlets to the patient right nhs gms nhs has got uh, leaflets pamphlets for everything so make sure you can mention like uh, if you're not able to finish or you have got some more things to say you can simply say we will give you some leaflets and pamphlets read about it and if you've got any concern queries please come back i'll be more than happy to answer right one thing they say don't refer the patient to the internet you know sometimes if you say like, okay you can just google it google will give you the information but google will scare you as well if you have got mild chest pain it might be simple muscle pain muscle pull as well but what google will say for chest pain heart attack you have got mild headache it might be simple headache but what google will say it is brain tumor so we have to be very careful try not to refer the patient to the internet but you can definitely definitely offer leaflets and pamphlets that's really important right all right so let's see this slide i would say one of the most important slide of the day how to prepare for blab 2 how to prepare for blab 2 no worries we are almost done right so how to prepare for blab to correct guidelines to support so what you need to do first of all you need to know what's the content of uh, lab 2 what are the things you should be having uh, course you have to take it's not like mandated to be very honest if you ask me we definitely have to take the course the lab 2 course so it is entirely up to you mostly candidates they take why do they take because uh, it becomes easy for the, them to do the things in the exam why because uh, what blueprint of lab to say is that they can ask you anything what you have done in your medical school see we have done lots of things in medical school and it's not that easy for us to do the remember those things actually isn't it so it's up to you to do the course or not and uh, uh, and nowadays because of lockdown if you feel it's difficult so online courses are uh, helpful actually you can sit at home and you can see uh, at the comfort of your house as well right that's something very very important material is very important you can um, course materials are uh, very important you know if you are booking for example our course we do send uh, the pdf files for our material and you can read about it so many candidates they ask when should i book the exam sorry when should i book the course you can book anytime because we are there with you until unless you pass you can attend the course again and you know, that's not the problem from our side right and the course material so once you book the course you will get the material at the same time so that's something very 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 important right because it's it's good if you have read the stuff once before you come to the course before you attend the course if you haven't done that's also fine right that's not a big deal youtube videos are very important you know you can uh, see our youtube channel ankur garg aspire if you google if you put on youtube you, will, you can find our youtube channel where you will find lots of videos which are actually for plot 2 uh, you will see like those videos will be very very helpful and uh, 
all the things, almost all the stuff regarding examination mannequin, we have kept on the YouTube. So it's a free, it's available. You can just have a look, right? Just to subscribe our channel and see the videos and all, and you will see it will actually prepare you before you come to the UK for the exam or for the coaching, maybe. And you will see you'll be well well prepared as compared to others. So that's something very important. So when you join the course, you'll get the material and YouTube links are there. You can definitely have a look. Maybe daily just make a habit of uh, seeing one, two videos. If there are not many. They're like around 25 videos are there and see, see those things. So that will be really, really helpful. Right. And when I should uh, book the exam and course and all those things, what we advise after the course, we want you to practice for four to six weeks. Many candidates, they say, no, I cannot like uh, put uh, this much of time. See, it depends on your communication skills as well. It depends uh, on uh, your background, your uh, background uh, knowledge of uh, communication and all because in some countries yes they are now started giving some importance to the co communication thing as well but some are not that much good you should know about your weaknesses you should know about your strength if you feel i'm good in it so you may spend a bit less time but it is not about that it's about the expenses as well if you have to stay in the uk it will be expensive so if you have to spend say six weeks after the course courses of 12 days plus six weeks is around two months time i mean it's i'm not saying it's that easy so what to do what is the best thing to do what we advise is you can do online course first so you have done the material you have seen all the youtube videos you have done the course as well so what you do you can read the stuff and you can practice few things online as well with your colleagues so when you come to the uk if you feel like attending few classes you can attend again live classes maybe no problem from our side for example and what else you can do you can practice in the academy and uh, do the mocks so maybe that time you can cut short it to three to four weeks isn't it so here you're attending the course 12 days then four to six weeks of practice two to two months and too much of stress but if you have attended if you are attending the course before you have read the material you have attended the course once you have got fair idea about club you have seen the youtube videos and everything so you are fully prepared when you're coming to the uk you are fully prepared so when you come into the UK, what is your main aim is to practice, practice, practice. You're practicing with your colleague. That's your main aim and giving the mocks. That's your main aim. So you can cut short your stay in the UK. Yeah, that's the thing. But always, always make sure you have got enough time because, you know, if you have got enough time, you'll feel more comfortable, more confident when you appear for club two. That is what we want. And nowadays what's happening, like the number of cases are increasing, number of scenarios are increasing. So it's better, best, I would say, to keep some time. Many candidates, they have passed the exam during the course. They have or they have just a few days, four or five days after the course and they pass the exam with very good marks. That's not like, like you cannot pass or something like that. You can. But if you have got enough time, you will feel more and more comfortable. That's the thing. How practice? Practice during the course, for example, like uh, our course, like you can, when, when the academy opens, so you can come before the class starts and practice. And once the course finishes on that day, you can practice, 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 and practice. Read the material at home, maybe. And when you come to the academy, practice. So even after the course, uh, you are reading the material. Don't waste time in the academy, just reading, reading, reading. What you do, read at home. And when you come to the academy, all of you are sitting, all the colleagues, and practice. So practice in the academy make small small groups with your fellow colleagues uh, no uh, after the course or during the course you'll make some friends you'll see like who has exam on the same day almost the same day as you so make a small group four or five people and start practicing because that will be really helpful if you make small small groups because small groups you won't be doing too much of chit chat small a bit of chit chat is fine but if you do too much of chit chat it will be chit chat only no work you have to consider both the things together we have to make sure that we are doing all the things uh, uh, properly so small small groups and start practicing so after you are done the course make a plan first day i'm going to do like uh, these uh, things like seven eight station from medicine a uh, few station from counseling few ethics station few examination because if you just do medicine only for first few days and then start with the counseling and then with ethics it becomes boring at some point of time and it will not make much sense as well so what we say practice with everything and uh, like take few stations from medicine few surgery maybe counseling ethics and examination and practice in that way and keep changing your partners that's really important i mean we always say stick to the same partner but here 
as many as partner you can change that would be helpful right practice as much as you can and practice with different different people so once you have done the course you practice so once with the one group maybe then change the group change with other people because you know you will be becoming more comfortable with one or two person we don't want that you have to change the partner and the others may be able to tell you the different mistakes and uh, take the criticism in a good way i mean sometimes what happened can they're practicing and they're saying oh i i told you the feedback by the person is like okay you missed this you missed this you missed that and then you are not able to take that criticism good criticism is always uh, good you know the positive criticism so it's not about like they're not there to tell you okay you did well that's not the thing you want to achieve. you want to know your weaknesses okay you didn't do well you didn't do well here you didn't do well here you could have done this you can have done this that's how you get the feedback and if you keep changing your part you'll see you'll get more feedback you'll get feedback from more people that will be really good so that's something you need to do uh, keep changing the partner and get the good feedback right an exam exam is about confidence to be very honest this confidence is going to help you under confidence that is very much uh, killer i would say and overconfidence make sure overconfidence also should not be there uh, you know sometimes when you practice too much and you feel oh, i know everything so you know it, one attitude you'll build one attitude inside you which is killer i've seen sometimes some candidates when they know everything so when we do the consultation and the way they say sorry oh, okay I'm, I'm sorry to hear that tell me more about it the facial expression the body language shows that you are not at all into the station you're not at all worried about the station you're just showing off your knowledge no that's not the thing so be very 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 careful uh, don't be underconfident, don't be overconfident, but confidence should be there. That's very important, right? Be very sympathetic, or I would say empathetic, right? So take care of your patient. Patient oriented consultation. What patient wants, you are concentrating on that thing. So patient oriented consultation, you're supposed to do. Idea, concern, expectation, very, very important. And please, 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 please let the patient let the patient talk that's very important because the patient is not able to talk things will be difficult you won't be able to understand what's the problem really so let 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 the patient talk that's really important so this is how you prepare for the exam so my sincere advice would be book the online course maybe if you want and uh, youtube videos it's uh, lots of csa videos are also available on youtube and our youtube channel you can see examination videos uh, for sure and uh, one more thing uh, good news for all of you we are coming up with our app actually and uh, soon hopefully next month you will be seeing uh, we are working on it as you can see this uh, green screen behind me it's just uh, the studio small studio just we are recording some lectures we'll coming up with our uh, plug to app so you will see the things will be more and more easy for you we're trying to make it easier easier and more easier and our material if you'll read it's very concise and straight to the point we have written so we don't want like people to uh, read too much of stuff it's not something we are preparing you for some super speciality exam it's a simple licensing exam and we're trying to keep it simple and trying to put more and more of interpersonal skills which is the key to success for this exam right <clears throat> okay so i hope that uh, you got something from this uh, session this was informative thank you so much for attending it and uh, more than thousand candidate have attended actually still we have got around 700 candidates thank you so much and if you've got uh, uh, any question any doubt you can email us info at aspire to plab.com uh, you can um, see our website if you want to know about the next dates of the courses. You can WhatsApp uh, this uh, 7481954646. It's my number. And the next one, uh, double, double seven one triple zero one eight seven to my colleague, Dr. Nick Hill's number. Right, so you can WhatsApp. If you've got any doubt, we'll be happy to help you. Facebook group, you can uh, join our Facebook group because uh, we keep on updating the things, whatever new we have got. So join our Facebook group, Aspire Club to buy Dr. Ankur Garg. You can join it and you'll get all the updates. Our YouTube channel, Ankur Garg Aspire, you can just go on and uh, see uh, the videos that will be really helpful. And all these videos are in regards to Club. 
too, right? Instagram, we have got some videos on Instagram as well, some posters and all some informative medical posters also we keep on posting. You can follow us there as well. It's Aspire to Education, right? So this is about uh, PLAP2 introduction, right? So one quote also we have written, distance between your dreams and reality is called action. So I know you have seen the dreams and you have started working. That's why you have done PLAP1. Take action and do PLAP2 as well and get the registration and start working. That's what we want to achieve as soon as possible. All right, so thank you. Thank you so much. Right, so let's see some questions. I hope uh, uh, you have asked some questions. So I'll try to answer all these uh, questions as soon as possible. So if um, you don't have any question, you can uh, start doing your work, what you were doing. And otherwise, if you want to have the answers, I will answer. Uh, Dr. Thin uh, asking, how may I know when will the academy open? So nobody knows, the government will tell you and <laughs> hope whenever the guidelines from the government will be there to open the academy we will open right thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you uh, what is the selection scenario going to be like for imgs now see nobody <laughs> see what happened you have to do plab first or any of the royal college exam maybe mrcp uh, so once you are done with your plab you start working here and then they will be having uh, the selection procedure they have got the round interviews as well and the good thing now for ings as well you can apply in round one as well initially the round one used to be only for the britishers and european and we used to apply in round two but now you can apply in round one as well and there are fair chances that you will get the training post here right <clears throat> best date for booking an exam i have cleared my plab one yesterday you can book any of the date because the latest date available is in july august september so book any date you have got ample time to uh, prepare yourself for plab two will you kindly be able to make a video on the hand examination all right my friend i have posted elbow examination day before yesterday just have a look at elbow examination and uh, as you said for hand examination no worries we will do it as soon as possible right <clears throat> 